Hey, good morning, family. How are you doing? I hope you're having a great Labor Day weekend. Tomorrow is that day that we celebrate uh, our work, our labor, and have a day to just relax and, and enjoy in that. And so I hope that you have plans tomorrow to do that and maybe enjoy some time with friends or, or family. But today, it's good to worship with you. And in a few moments, you're going to be hearing a message from one of our elders, Rob McCrory, and he's got a great message out of Psalms to share with you. Uh, but a couple of things I want to share with you as we move into the fall here. One is next weekend, we're going to be having our final outdoor services next Sunday. And so, uh, and not only are we going to be doing our, our outdoor services, but we're also going to be doing baptisms out there. So it's going to be a really special day of celebration. So I want to invite you to come and be a part of that next Sunday. Uh, you do need to sign up online and it will be a fun time out in the field celebrating some uh, new life, some new decisions for Christ and uh, as well as just celebrating and worshiping together. So that's next Sunday. And then the following weekend, the weekend of the 19th and 20th, that weekend we're going to be returning to indoor services. Now those services are going to be limited both in size of how many people we can have together in the auditorium as well as the size of our children's uh, classrooms and ministry. And so again, we're going to have to continue signing up each weekend for services. I know that it's a challenge to do that, but that's just part of the process right now. And, uh, and we want to, we've been longing to get back together and now we finally have that opportunity. We're going to be doing that, but we do have limited space in our services. We're going to uh, start off our fall here doing our, our regular services on Saturday night at six o'clock and Sunday morning at nine and 1045. And you'll have an opportunity to sign up for those on Saturday night. We're not going to be doing children's ministries. Uh, but on Sunday morning and both those services, those are going to be offered, but we have limited space. And so you need to sign up and uh, I know that it's a little bit of a hassle, but I think that it's worth walking through that so we can gather together. So please uh, look forward to doing that and signing up for that weekend as we begin meeting back together. It's going to be a, a great time. In fact, that first weekend, we're just going to plan it to be a celebration time together as we join and, uh, and worship really uh, together inside for the first time in about six months. And so we look forward to doing that. You just need to make sure and go online and sign up to do that. Now, I know that some people, for various reasons, you're not going to be able to still come uh, or you're not yet ready to come into, into live services, and that's okay. We're going to just continue to be streaming our services every Sunday, so don't worry about that. You can still watch it online. Uh, but for those who are ready and, and, and desirous of coming together, we're going to be starting to do that indoors on the weekend of the 19th and 20th. So I look forward to seeing you then. Uh, but right now, why don't we take a few moments just to join in and worship together. And oh, like the skies are wide, crashing down to bring the world to Dancing on an empty grave Death has lost its rule to the King of Grace Be the crown in the light and the sound Be the fire burning inside out Be the love casting out That you may pull the atmosphere Oh, like the skies are wide Crashing down to bring the world to light Walking dead and on an empty grave Death is lost in
Through valleys and shadow we walk unafraid There in the battle we lift up your name Standing together forever we're marching on There's hope in our eyes For you are our victory Our joy in our prize Standing together Forever we're marching on We are believers All our hope in the risen one our soldiers we're fighting with faith and love and we are pilgrims on a journey to reach our home we are standing together we are the children of God Children of God, if nothing can stop us, for you're on our side, even in dying, our souls are alive, standing together forever. We're marching on. soldiers we're fighting with faith and love and we are pilgrims on a journey to reach our home we are standing together we are the children of God oh God, we love you. We thank you for the songs that we can sing. Lord, we are thankful that we can be called your children. Lord, that we are able to sing that confidently and know that we are secure in you and that you are a loving father. You're so good. Pray all this in your name. Amen. Good morning, church. If we've not met, my name is Rob McCrory, and I get to serve as one of your elders here at Smoky Point. I hope you're well. And I hope you're enjoying a nice long weekend. I was looking at Facebook last week and I got one of those notices, you know, the ones that are from the same time last year. It was a photo that I had posted of a vacation that Pam and I took. 
My first thought was, no way. A year has gone, gone away already, followed by wondering when we'd get another vacation free from all of this stuff that we're dealing with now. Well, Facebook did a good job of reminding me of that trip. Pam and I drove down to Salem and then headed for a night in Depot Bay. Now, now I'm sure many of you have been to the Oregon coast and it goes without saying that the views are just stunning. We got to stay in a condo that night, right on the cliffs, watching whales, and then went to dinner and uh, had this awesome sunset ocean view. The next morning, we left early, driving south. Again, we were blessed with an absolutely beautiful morning. No fog, no morning fog, just blue sky and more stunning ocean views. Oh, well, I guess I didn't tell you why we were doing this trip. You know, I'd never seen the Redwood Forest. It's one of those things, I guess, is kind of in our backyard, but you never get around to doing. Well, I remember rounding that corner on Highway 101 and seeing my first big tree right there, crowding the white line. It was awesome. And it was one, the first of many that we were gonna, were gonna see that day. Now there's a place along Highway 101 called the Trees of Mystery, I know. It's a tourist trap, but I loved it. You get to walk in the forest and see all these ginormous trees and you even get to see the names that they have given them. I remember walking up to the first one, looking up, trying to keep my balance, and I just had this sense of awe. And it doesn't stop. You walk the path and you see more and more what seemed like bigger and bigger trees. I thought I'd seen some pretty big trees, but nothing compares. This was awesome. Those few days were pretty great, filled with, if you will, awe. The beauty of the coast, the trees. My goodness, God's creation was on full display, and we truly were in awe. Well, we arrived in Eureka, California, and who did we run into? The Weavers. Awesome. Okay, well, we were not in awe, but that was pretty cool. Well, there hasn't been any real awe-inspiring vacations for the McCrory's uh, this summer. Maybe that's the same for you, but one sure place we can go to be in awe is in God's Word. But what does it mean to be in awe? So I looked it up in the dictionary. The dictionary says, a feeling of reverential Respect mixed with fear and wonder. Psalms 111.10 says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fear of the Lord. It's not about being afraid of God, but as Hebrews 12 shows us, it's having a right reverence and awe for God. This, I believe, is the beginning of wisdom. So let's, let's pull out our Bibles now and open to Psalms 139 and see if we can find ourselves in a right reverence and awe of God this morning through this song from King David. And as we read through this psalm this morning, let the passage, let David show you who God is. Let's look up and experience that sense of awe that comes from knowing the nature and character of our great God. Psalms 139, verse 1, O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down. You are acquainted with all of my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O oh Lord, you know it all together. You hem me in before, behind and before, and lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Notice here the, the picture of God David is building for us, telling us what is true only of God. He says, you have searched me and known me. So he understands God is able to see all there is to see about him. He says, you know when I sit down and when I rise up, he acknowledges that God is familiar with his habits. Then look at what he says next. You discern my thoughts from afar. David acknowledges that God even knows what's going on in his head, even before it enters his actions or his speech. 
Verse three, you search out my path and my lying down. He knows that God is aware of his location regardless of where he goes. David goes on to say, you are acquainted with all of my ways even before a word is on my tongue. Behold, O Lord, you know it all together. David is painting a, a, a picture for us of God who doesn't just hold some knowledge, but holds all knowledge. He paints a picture of a God who knows our habits, our thoughts, our location, our words. A God who knows everything altogether about him. I spent part of last week uh, in eastern Washington on a farm of a friend of mine. He's a grain grower uh, down in the Palouse. And I was riding one morning in the combine with him, and we were talking about this year's crop, and it, you know, it just always amazes me how much he knows, whether it's, it's winter red weed or spring soft white, how the crop grows differently on a hillside from down on a flat, the density of the soil, erosion, and on and on. He, you know, why? Why does he know all this? Well, 30 years of learning and experience has gone into preparing the soil, choosing the, the seed to plant, the fertilizer, the spray for weeds, and the prayer for rain, all before he reaped what he'd sown. So when we think about the knowledge of God, the, the comprehensive knowledge of God, how does he know my thoughts before they're formed? How does he know a word before it's on my tongue? He knows because he's our origin. He doesn't have to learn. He holds all knowledge because he is the source of all knowledge. That's not like me. I'm still learning as I progress through this, this middle age of my life. And guess what? Now, now I'm starting to forget. And I've, if I'm honest, it's kind of scary. Yet God is a, a God who cannot even forget. He holds all knowledge. He's omniscient. He's not like anyone that I know. But David moves on from there. He says in verse five, you hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is, is too wonderful for me. It is high and I cannot attain it. Here we find two more things about God. When we read you hem me in behind and before, it, it sort of sounds like a big God hug. But I think what we see here is, is, is a reference to time. You hem me in, both in the past and in the future, and then you lay your hand on me, right here, right now. He is the God of the past and future. He is behind us and before. He is eternal. He was and he is and he is to come. And then such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high, I cannot attain it. A reference here to the incomprehensibility of God, the, the knowledge of who God is is too vast for us to comprehend. You know, I think we all like to be an expert at something. I like to think I'm an, I'm an expert, expert when it comes to grilling a steak. I've cooked them many ways with all kinds of spices and cooking methods. And I gotta tell you, I love my cooking. I mean, I am committed to it. And I spent a great deal of time mastering the steak. We like to feel like there's things that we have mastery over, that we have the full measure of, but, but God defies full measurements. He does not allow himself to be fully understood. I'm not like that. In fact, one time at work, I took this Myers-Briggs personality profile test thing. You answer a bunch of questions and it categorizes you into one of 16 buckets. Now, if you know me, especially maybe back then, I was way too complex of a guy to have them peg me. So I was skeptical. But when I got my results back, Myers-Briggs had me pegged. This company with a profile test understood me. You see, there are things that are generally true about us. We're just not that complex. Certainly relative to an infinite God, and, 
And David acknowledged that. He's not frustrated by it. He sees it as something to be celebrated, something worthy of our worship. Verse 7, let's read on. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed and shield, you are there. So he begins to unfold for us his worshipful appreciation for the omnipresence of God, that, that God is everywhere, fully present. Now look at the way he does this in poetic terms. He says, if I ascend to heaven, where is that? That's up. And if I make my bed in Sheol, Sheol's the grave, where would that be? I'd be down. If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. God is high. God is low. Let's keep reading verse 9. If I take the wings of the morning, where does the sun rise? In the east. And then and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. Now that seems like it's down again, right? But remember where David is. He's, he's in Israel. And where is the sea relative to him? It's to his west, right? Do you see what he's done here? He's painted a word picture. God is high, he is low, he is east, he is west. He is everywhere, fully present. Let's pick up in verse 10. Even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, even the darkness is not dark to you, the night is bright as day, for darkness is light with you. He is high and low, east and west. Darkness and light are the same to him. Nothing is hidden to him. He is everywhere fully present. I'm not like that. I wish I could be sometimes. You know, two places at once. Maybe three or four if, if you have kids going in all different directions at the same time. But here's the thing. God doesn't need that, that Facebook reminder like I do. As much as we enjoyed that trip, the ocean views, the big trees, even Facebook knows we don't remember all the details. God's not like that. He's there. He's there on the coast. He's, he's in the forest. He's here now. He doesn't need to be reminded. He's there now everywhere, fully present. And if you really want a headache, he's there in the past, and he's there in the future, eternally present. I'm not like that. I want to be, and we try to be, right? I mean, how many of you have DVRs that you record multiple shows at the same time? What about FaceTime or Zoom? It makes us feel like we can be in multiple places at once. But you know, for me, sometimes at the end of a long day on Zoom, sometimes, sometimes I don't feel like I was really present anywhere. But God, by contrast, is everywhere, fully present. There's not a piece of him here and a piece of him there. I don't know anyone like that. It makes me want to worship. Verse 13. For you form my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. This is a reference to God as self-existent. He's the one who creates. He creates and sustains life. Verse 14, I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Notice the focus here. It's not me fearfully and wonderfully made. It turns out that it's actually God, fearful and wonderful. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. And there's a reference to God's om omnipotence, his works, his mighty works. He is able to even knit life together in the secret place where it is darkness, but all darkness is light to him. Let's pick up in verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intric intricately woven in the depths of the earth. 
Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So now we've moved on from hearing that God is the creator of life and he is all powerful to this idea that he is sovereign. He numbers our days. That's kind of a saying today, right? We use it maybe as a threat, right? Maybe to one of our kids that is not acting the way we want. We say, your days are numbered. But it's not that. It's really the greatest comfort we can know. Like many of you, I, I had a health scare that started a couple of years ago. After some tests and scans, I was told that I had cancer in my right eye. What I knew to be true was the doctors could tell me what I didn't know about the condition of my body, but what they couldn't do is shorten the days of my life. Why? Because those rested in the hands of a sovereign God, a God who has determined exactly how many days it is for me to accomplish what he's made me to do. David understands that God is uniquely qualified to be in control, to be sovereign. So he celebrates that. Let's look at verse 17. How precious to me are your thoughts, O God. How vast is the sum of them. If I would count them, there are more than the sand. I awake and I am still with you. David pulls into focus here that, that God is immeasurable. And catch the irony here. He's just, he's just described himself as, in comparison to God, that he is measurable. He is quantifiable. His thoughts are able to be known. His days are numbered. And we know from other places in Scripture that even the number of our hairs on our head are known. We are quantifiable. I mean, if we step on a scale, we know how much we weigh. If we hold up a tape measure, we know just how tall we are. We are limited a set of limitations. And now he turns and says, you, God, are, are, are vast. Your thoughts are countless. They are more than the sand. He is infinite. He is immeasurable. My hope this morning is that you're getting that sense of awe as you see God through this Psalm of David, and that, that, that awe, that sense of awe should generate a response within us. But what is it? Well, there's actually some science around this. this the, the, people have actually done research around this sense of awe, and they've concluded that when we feel genuine awe, it turns our attention away from ourselves toward other people. It makes us others-focused. But how does this happen? Let's see what David's response is as we get into verse 19. And this might be a section of the psalm that we'd rather skip past, but let's see what it says. Verse 19. Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. O oh, men of blood, depart from me. They speak against you with malicious intent. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with complete hatred. I count them my enemies. Complete hatred. Where did this come from? Well, what we know about David is that he had actual physical enemies coming against him. They were enemies not just of David, but enemies of God. So when we read this, it is appropriate for David to feel complete hatred toward those who hate the truth. But what about us? Do we have physical enemies coming against us? What does Ephesians 6.12 say about our enemies? That our battle is not against flesh and blood as David's was. Our battle is a spiritual battle. Romans 8.13 says that we are to put to death the deeds of of the body. And 1 Peter 2.11 says that we are to abstain from sinful desires that wage war against our souls. So who is our battle against? It's really against the world, the flesh, and the devil. We have to battle against sin. 
So what awe should inspire in us is this complete hatred of personal sin. What we see, that, that we see a vision of God that is high and lifted up, and our response is like that of Isaiah. Isaiah in chapter 6, where he, where he immediately has this sense of his own sinfulness, and he cries out, woe is me, because I'm a man of unclean lips, and I'm surrounded, I'm dwelling among a people of unclean lips. So let me ask, does our conception of God cause a complete hatred of sin in us? Because if it doesn't, then it doesn't, then it lacks awe. It lacks awe. Our battle is not against flesh and blood, and, and we're called to take up the armor of God every day against enemies, against very real enemies doing battle against our soul. The theologian John Owen once said, be killing sin or sin will be killing you. What would it look like if we woke up every morning and contemplated the awe of God and turned and hated selfishness? What if I hated self-centeredness, self-sufficiency? What if I turned all my energy to eradication of all those sins from my life? What do you think eradication of all those sins would do to my relationships with other people? Wouldn't I be better able to fill the great command? I would become others focused, as the great command would tell me to do. Now let's look at the end of this psalm. What the end result is for David of contemplating the holiness and otherness of God and seeing himself in relationship to it. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any grievous way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. It's interesting because, because what did he start with in verse 1? Oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. And here at the very end, the psalm says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Why? What does he know? He knows that this, this process of hating sin and seeing himself in relationship to God, who is like no other, is one that needs to be repetitive and ongoing. That during his lifetime, he will never reach, never reach, the end of seeing himself in relation to God. David understood that the, the knowledge of self and the knowledge of God go hand in hand. There is no true knowledge of self apart from God. I know, we try. We, we measure ourselves against other people, right? We can always find that person and say, sure, I'm, I, I'm not the most merciful person, but that guy. Or, I know I grumble about stuff, but that person is always complaining. It's not until I lay myself against the infinitely good, the infinitely truthful, the infinitely, from, infinitely merciful, just and gracious measuring rod that is God himself that I understand who I truly am. And then what? Then I can cry out to God and ask him to help me, to change me because I don't want to be like this anymore. Someone once said, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then it follows the fear of men is the beginning of folly. The thing I've come to realize that is perhaps the most convicting about looking at what is only true of God and then wanting to be true of me is that when I do try to become God, whether it's at home or, or work, this this terrible thing happens. People commend me for it. When I, when I want to be self-sufficient, when I, when I want to have no needs, something that is only true of God himself, when I behave in a way that's independent of other people, people tell me, you're so strong. You're such a hard worker. When I try to deny the fact that I'm not self-sustaining, when I say, I don't need to rest, I can just keep working when I try to ascribe something to myself that is only true of God, people, people celebrate that and they tell me, you should be promoted. And when I try to overmanage my, 
my wife or my family or my coworkers, always offering them the better path. You know what they say? You're so wise, you're so caring. So often our attempts to become like God don't draw the rebuke they should, but they draw favor from those who don't know God. Sometimes, if we're honest, even in our Christian community, we celebrate this. I mean, how often do we expect our church leaders to be godlike instead of just being humans, serving a God who is like no other? This should be a chilling thought for us. Let's not live a life devoid of awe that makes much of ourselves. Instead, let's, let's strive for a daily dose of awe. We are blessed here to live in the Pacific Northwest where we don't have to go far to find the beauty of God's creation. But what about those rainy COVID days ahead? You and I as a, as a community of faith, as, as those who believe in Jesus Christ and attest to him as our savior, we have something that is drawn in a fine tip pen, something that tells us about the nature and character of God that only can be hinted at as we gaze out on the splendor of creation. We have his word. We have his word right here, all we need for our daily dose of awe. How important do you think it is to spend time there? So there are things that are only true of God, his omniscience, his omnipotence, omnipresence, all of these things we try to mimic, just like Adam and Eve in the garden who reached out for, the, for a fruit that promised that you will become like him. And yet, all the time we're being held out these other fruits. Maybe you know them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. These fruits are being held out to us and, and said, this is the way, walk in it. We dare not be so consumed trying to trying to become like God in ways that we can never be like him, that we neglect to be conformed to the image of his son in ways that would transform our homes, our church, our community. My prayer for us this morning is that we would live a life that reveals the awe that David shows us here in Psalms 139, that you would know the God who is fearful and wonderful in such a way that, that you would long for the fruit that is intended for us, that in all things we would see the Lord glorified. Let's pray. Lord God, speak your truth to our hearts. Give us a vision of you high and lifted up. We pray, Lord, that it would be our experience to have a daily dose of awe, gazing upon who you are and being brought into right worship. We pray all these things in your son's name. Amen. This next song that we're going to sing is a new one, and it hits on what Rob was talking about in his sermon about Christ being all around us. And coincidentally, the name of the song is Christ Be All Around Me. As I rise, strength of God, go before and lift me up. of God, look upon and be my sight. As I wait, heart of God. Satisfy and sustain as I hear the voice of God. Lead me on and be my guide, be my guide. Yeah. 
that sees me Christ be all the I stand 
in all of you. What king would leave his throne and set his crown as high? But his own creation bid us sin and die. Relenting love, never ending grace, oh God, we praise your name, and I stand in all of you, and I stand that we're able to feel a sense of awe when worshiping you, when thinking about you, when spending time with you. Lord, that is something that we are able to wrap our minds around and understand the meaning of. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for the word given by Rob. And we thank you that we're able to gather here together today. Lord, we love you. We pray all this in your name. Amen. As always, it's great worshiping with you. Can't wait to see you at the baptism service that's coming up. Be sure to sign up for that. We want to see you there. It's going to be a great time, so please don't miss it. Well, the only thing left is tithe. Feel free to give to one of these three options. Again, that is not a requirement of saying, hey, if you watch this, you have to give. But it's a continuation of giving of ourselves. Just like whenever we worship, it's not just singing. We worship as an act of giving in our daily life and how we live. So tithe is just a continuation of our worship this morning. Hope you have a great rest of your Sunday. Hopefully, I'll see you next week. Have a good one.